Hi there, how's it going? I hope you're all doing well. Today's episode is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform. I'm just kidding, of course, but the fact that you believed it is very flattering. Today, we're going to learn about a new algorithm, but before we can use it on a complex environment, we first of all need to verify that it works on the simplest possible one, by which I mean a grid node, of course, which is a topic I covered so long ago, you didn't even realize that that's not the original environment that we used. This one is. Even Greg has changed. You can see it in his eyes. And the reason I had to program everything from scratch again is because I lost the code. All of it. So I had to do that again. But that was not much of a problem as the environment was quite simple. So like Q-learning from the previous episode, today's algorithm is also part of the reinforcement learning family. And I just realized that I hadn't even properly introduced reinforcement learning yet. So here's a short summary. In reinforcement learning, you have in reinforcement learning, you have the agent which sees the current state of the environment. Based on that state, the agent performs an action and the environment advances one step. After that step, a new state is observed and the agent receives some reward for its previously chosen action. And this choosing an action part varies depending on the algorithm that you use. For example, in Q-learning from the previous episode, we learned a so-called Q-table and derived the policy of how we want to select actions based on that table. Here's an example of a Q-table. You can see the states on the left with the actions on the right. And each value in the Q-table gives a measure of how good it is to perform a certain action in a particular state. For example, moving right in state 1 is valued at 0, while moving down is valued at 0.25. This table is constantly changing as the agent explores more and more states of the environment. A quick word about states. Right now we're only familiar with grid worlds, but what exactly is a state in a grid world? Or rather, what properties should we expect a state to have? Well, ideally a state should be unique. This means the state should be different if our agent is here than if it was there. If the state representation for both situations were the same, the agent would behave the same in both cases, which isn't what we want. In our grid world, a unique identifier for a state is just a number. So we can enumerate every state that our agent can visit and give each of them a unique number. That's the state in our grid world. It's a value that uniquely describes a state of the environment. Looking back at our Q table, you might be asking, so how do we derive a policy from that table? One way of, tell me. Um, okay. One way of deriving a policy will be to perform the best action at every state. During training, it makes sense to occasionally introduce some random actions to ensure that the agent explores the environment, because otherwise the agent would only follow a single state action path every time. Algorithms that derive the policy from a learned Q table are called value-based approaches. But there are other methods that learn the policy directly or that learn the model of the environment. Those methods are called policy-based and model-based approaches respectively. We will get to those in future episodes. Today's algorithm falls under the value-based category because it too learns the Q table. And the algorithm I keep talking about this whole time is called SARSA, which stands for State Action Reward, State Action. And it's another tabular algorithm, so there are no neural networks in play just yet, but it's still, like regular Q-learning, very powerful. Let's have a look at the update rule of SARSA to see how it differs from Q-learning. We can see that both formulas are already quite similar, but there is a key distinction between these two functions. The difference is here in the temporal target part. In SARSA, the next action is chosen by your current policy. For example, your policy could be to take the best action 90% of the time and choose a random action for the remaining 10%. So your current action A for state S is chosen in that manner. And the next action A prime for the next state S prime is chosen like that as well. All part of your agent's current policy. It's on the policy, so it's called an on policy algorithm. But that's not the case for Q-learning. While your current action A might be chosen in the same 90-10 fashion, the next action A' prime for the next state S' prime is chosen with this max function. Your 90-10 policy might have produced a random action, but the max part will pick a different action, different from what your agent's current policy would have picked. It's off from your current policy, therefore it's called an off-policy algorithm. And by the way, between us, that's a very typical exam question, so note-taking is highly advised. Okay, now that we know the difference between these two algorithms, we can finally implement SARSA and compare it to Q-learning on the grid world. All right, with SARSA now implemented, let's have Greg do his thing. Oh my God, what what happened? Where am I? What is this? State zero? Um, move down? Oh my God, the pain. Oh no, oh, that hurt. State seven? Um, move down? 
Oh, that hurt. Oh, no. Oh, that hurt a lot. Oh, my God. Why is, why is this happening? One eternity later. Stay 47. I don't know, man. Move right. Oh. Oh, oh, that didn't hurt at all. That that felt actually really nice. Well, it's over then. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's finally over. Oh, God, yes. It's over. No more pain. Oh, look at him go. All right, let's speed this up. Now you might be wondering how I got these numbers for the hyperparameters and if I just tested my algorithms by hand like a savage caveman to get these numbers. The answer is of course not. But finding good values for these hyperparameters is an unbelievably tedious task in reinforcement learning, so I decided to use a framework called Optuna, which finds the best hyperparameters for whatever algorithm it is that you're using. It's super easy to use and task agnostic, so I use that instead of finding these values by hand. If there's enough demand, I could make a more in-depth video about Optuna in the future, but for now, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, carry on. Now that we have verified that both SARSA and Q-Learning work, it's time to unleash these algorithms to more complex and interesting environments. Well, first of all, I have to implement it, but luckily we can skip that part by using the <laughs> of video editing. And here's the new environment. Introducing Greg Poll. The goal of Greg Poll is quite simple. Keep the poll up for as long as possible. If the poll falls 45 degrees to either side, the game ends. Initially, I had set it up such that a reward of one was given for every step that the poll was up. But that didn't quite work because the agent just did this. It tilted the poll and blasted off to either one side. So I changed the reward function and now reward is given proportionate to how close the pole is to zero degrees and how slowly the pole moves. The closer to zero degrees and the slower the pole, the more reward the agent gets. There are three actions for this environment. Move right, move left and do nothing. Interestingly, the hard part of this environment is that most of the time you don't even want to go left or right and instead only occasionally adjust the card's trajectory. And the eagle-eyed viewer among you has probably already noticed that we're dealing with continuous numbers here. So we can't just enumerate the states like we did before. But we still need a table, so what's the solution here? To turn continuous numbers into discrete numbers, we bin or digitize the numbers. The concept is actually quite simple. Imagine that your state is a continuous number from 0 to 1, but ideally you would want to have 10 states. Then you can make 10 slices, or bins as they're called, of the range of your numbers. So in this example you could say that bin 1 goes from 0 to 0 0.1 and bin 2 from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. If your state is for example 0 0.05, then that would correspond to bin number 1 as it falls in that range. A state with a value 0 0.15 would be bin number 2 and so on. One. The downside is that you lose some precision, which you could fix by increasing the number of bins, but that in turn would make your queue table much bigger. So it's a fine balance to strike. In this environment, I went with the card position, the angular velocity and angle of the pole as states and choose 50 as the number of bins. And with all of this set up, it's time to compare Q-Learning and Sarsa on the Gregpole environment. I'm not going to show you the whole training process though, as that would take way too long.
As you can see, our agent managed to balance the pole quite effectively, although there were still some issues, and we can see that we're almost approaching the limits of what you can do with tabular methods. Luckily, the world of reinforcement learning is huge and many, many more fascinating approaches are waiting for us to learn about them. So there's a lot to do in the future. So this was it for this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it and perhaps even learned something new. As always, stay healthy and I will see you in the next one.